Uh, we, we had agreed that uh, this block was going to be on um, uh, uh, explaining to you, uh, as master students first year, how we obtain new knowledge. All right? And one of the ways that we do that is uh, both by doing research, but also by uh, reading other people's um, publications. And so this Today's um, research lecture is a bit of a combination between, uh, let's say, a bit like a demonstration of how uh, a journal plot would go, in essence. So I'll be presenting a bit, and I'll be asking you about a question. You all read the paper for today, and so you know everything about it. And you can tell me afterwards whether you liked it or not. <coughs> Uh, and then the second part of the uh, this morning, or this presentation, it's from 11 to 1, I think. Um, one of my uh, former PhD students, and currently postdoc in the lab, Peggy Pickards, uh, will tell you uh, a little bit of a follow-up study that we've uh, done and recently published, based on uh, the paper that... Uh, I'm, still, I'm still not confused here, right? Can you see that? Hmm, I have a complete screen here. And what if I toggle a few times? What is that? Oh, no, I don't have to do that here. No, well, we'll just, if anything falls off, we'll, uh, I'll try to explain. So in the last part, before we leave, uh, we'll have some time to discuss um, problems that we have arisen when you were reading the, uh, the journal cafe on Friday. And of course, of course, every one of you has read it, right? Good discussions about that. All right. So I'm going to tell you something about um, a bit about the research that we're doing in my group. We're interested in how cells change, use epigenetics to change gene expression paths. So how cells talk to chromatin. Uh, we uh, last Monday we, we we discussed how epigenetics, which is basically uh, study of packing and unpacking genes, how that is, is fundamental to phenotypic plasticity. You all remember these, these pictures, of course. DNA is not naked. It's wrapped around histones, and they're not only there to provide structure, structural uh, support, but they actually have little tails that can be modified. <coughs> and together, all these chemical modifications, they provide an epigenetic regi register, a local status of gene activity, or whatever. Uh, actions that have to be taken. I don't think this is going to bother us too much. But anyway, it's we'll see. And so, um, understanding how cell signaling um, reaches chromatin and how cells um, at a molecular level integrate these uh, signals, these cues, and actually do something with them in terms of gene regulation and mount a response. Understanding those mechanisms is, of course, going to be important uh, for when we want to uh, develop drugs uh, that target any of these processes that are involved. And as we've seen, I mean, this is going to be relevant to several areas in medicine, including regenerative medicine, cancer, the metabolic syndrome, and even maybe psychological disorders, right? And so, this is the group of proteins that we're interested in. They're called the polycone group proteins. Who's heard of polycone? We'll start with these questions. Right? No one heard of polycone. Excellent. <laughs> Excellent. Well, polycone group proteins, or the repressive complexes, <laughs> the polycone repressive complexes, they come in two flavors. Well, they come in a lot of flavors. But two are sufficient to explain the way in which these things work. We have an in initiating complex, which we call PRC2. That's logic. And then we have a maintenance complex, which we call PRC1. You, see, you should know what one or not. I'm going to do this green. No? You come from Paris? No, you haven't been in Paris. No, no. Oh, you're excused. Yeah. There's a lot of people working on polycone there. So I figured maybe you should do it. 
Um, they were discovered in, 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 in contra chronological order. So that's how these came to fly in Drosophila. So that's how these ended up being called number one and these number two. Now, what we see here is that there is a, an epigenetic writer <coughs> called EZH, an answer of Zesty. Forget about the names. These refer to the phenotypes that occur. Most of these uh, refer to the phenotypes that occur in, in Drosophila, banana fly, fruit fly, whenever these genes are mutated. EZH is a histone metal transferase. And what it does is it installs a trimethyl mark on histone 3 rising from the cell. We've seen that mark before, remember? And then there is this second complex that recognizes these K3 marks, these uh, sort of K27 trimethyl marks, through a protein called CDX, or Polycom, the founding member of the whole family the first one discovered in, in Drosophila. And so that's a reader, right? And what <coughs> these complexes do, uh, the name already, the acronym here, suggests that it's a depressor, it's a polypropressive complex. Um, they repress gene transcription. And they do that in the context of development. They provide the cell with the transcription memory. So whenever genes have been turned off in development, their, their, their off status is maintained by polygon group complexes. Their counter counterpart, which we're not going to talk about today, and the tri-thorax proteins, complex group proteins, they do exactly the opposite. Whatever was turned on in a specific lineage is kept on by uh, tri-thorax complexes. And one of the proteins that is that is a member of this trithorax complex is MLL. And that's an H3K4 trimethyl transferase. Okay? We've talked about those as well. Remember that were these. Oops. This one. This was the on mark, this was the off mark. So I've told you now what is um, what is going on with polycom. So they're repressors, they're they're part of them. Transcriptional memory system in the cell, they're all in development. And how do we know that? Well, we know that from studies in Drosophila. Male fruit flies have little um, stiff bristles on their front legs. The flies have six legs to here, to there, and to there. And uh, only the front legs carry little, little structures called sex combs. I always figured that sex combs were there to uh, stimulate the females, but apparently, um, <coughs> I, uh, um, I always thought that they were there to, to sense pheromones from females, but they were really there to stimulate the females. Um, any mutation in oligom group proteins will actually affect uh, expression of Hox genes. And I guess most of you will have heard of Hox genes. These are important proteins and factors, again, in embryonic development that play an important role in anterior, posterior pattern, I should say, anterior, posterior pattern. In the fly, that's a nice example. It is the combination of Hox genes that occur in a, in a cluster, the combination of Hox genes, which, which is expressed in a larval segment which eventually determines the identity of the segment in the adult fly. So there's three head segments, there's three thoracic head segments, and there's eight <coughs> abdominal segments. And all of them look different, and that's because they express different Hox genes. Now, if polygon group genes are mutated or overexpressed in the fly, we get segment identity shifts because Hox genes are deregulated. And in the case of polygon mutations, uh, you get actually extra sex combs. And that's where the name derives from, polygon. Too many sex combs, all right? Easy peasy. And so this is what that looks like. So this is, would be a normal front leg, T1, tarsal 1, 
front leg of the fly, this one with a sex with a little sex comb on it. And this would be the third wild type leg. And this is the third wild type leg of an animal that has that carries a polygon mutation called PC1. So you can see that these bristles are actually being formed here as a result of the misexpression of hoxines. Now, hoxines, of course, we know from um, from these type of studies, and these are these are of course, of course almost uh, legendary. One gene mutation in the hoxine called antennapedia causes um, front legs to be formed on the head instead of antenna. All the other transformations from the other field class. And here there's a there's a mutation that causes the first thoracic segment, the second thoracic segment to transform into uh, the first one. And you end up with a fly with four wings instead of two. One gene. One gene. Okay? So posterior anterior posterior type Serious <coughs> segmentation of genes. Now, despite the fact that we lack sex codes, I wonder how what that would have felt like, but anyways, we don't have it. We do have ox genes, we humans, we have polygon genes. Okay? The function, the structure is conserved, and as a matter of fact, our segmentation is conserved as well in embryology. Only you can't see it that well. Um, but in, in development, it is clear that when the somites, this is a mouse skeleton, or at least a ribcage, the part of the, you know, the spinal, uh, the, ver the vertical column, here's the head, here's the tail, it's clear that all these vertebrae have, a, have an identity. They're different from the previous and from the next one. And what we see if we mutate these polygon group proteins is that we get vertical identity shapes. So, structurally, <coughs> Functionally, ox genes and oracle genes all conserve. And so this is how they do that. They maintain ox gene expression boundaries through leaving marks, epigenetic marks, around genes that are supposed to be repressed. And this is the complex that breeds them. Uh, we remember uh, these common domain proteins that had a groove in which this extended N terminus of histone free fits and it recognizes and binds the trimethyl group on lysine 27. Here it is, the white thing. In the meanwhile, we have learned that there is a lot more to it than just these simple writers, this simple writer and that simple reader. We know that there is uh, EED, which recognizes other epigenetic marks, <coughs> and also brings the whole complex to an area which is supposed to be trimethylated. And we also know <coughs> that these two proteins collaborate in leaving other marks, ubiquitous marks, on a different histone chip. And so the story gets more complex. The story gets even more complex if we look at what type of epigenetic regulators on top of polyamorous com complexes <coughs> interact with these things and make things happen. Uh, H DACs, D ubiquitolases, D ubiquitolases, D methyl transferases. Uh, the conjugases, kinases, uh, and, and especially this part is what this, uh, this presentation of the line is of Peggy will be about. So there's lots going on. Obviously, we have 20,000 <coughs> plus proteins in, uh, probably, uh, uh, in, in many different supply scenarios, and all these proteins do something. So there's no such thing as life is simple. All right. How do we know polygon function in humans? Well, they're best known for their function, for their effect in cancer. The founding member of the polygon group proteins in, uh, in uh, humans, <coughs> human cancer, mouse cancer, is a protein called BMI1. B cell MIC interacting on the gene 1 was found as a gene that collaborates with MIC, transgenic MIC mice, develop leukemia, and the screen for other genes that would accelerate leukemia produced BMI. 
it is capable by itself of, of uh, inducing leukemia. How does it do that? Well, I told you that the whole complex acts as a repressor. And actually, BMI is the whole complex is sitting on top of a locus called A4A, CKM2A, A4A, P16. Most of you have heard of RV and P53, I guess, right? Important tumor suppressor genes. Don't tell me no, because then I'm going to cry. Right. And these two proteins, RV and P53, they control the cell cycle. Together, these pathways, the RV pathways and the P53 pathways, constitute 90 plus percent of all tumors of all tumorigenic mechanisms. Uh, and so what I'm saying is in, in more than 90% of all tumors, something in the RV pathway and or something in the P3 pathway is mutated. So those are extremely important um, uh, pathways. But the trick here is that if you overexpress BMI and you repress expression of P16, the cell cycle inhibitor, or P14 and other cell cycle inhibitor, you don't need mutations. BMI can cause cancer, can create <coughs> cause for cancer um, by just being overexpressed. Okay? P16, you, you guys know that RV is, is progressively phosphorylated in the cell cycle, and, it's, and that is done, that is achieved by the cycle independent kinases, right? Achieve up the cyclins and they phosphorylate RV and let's go. RV is a repressor that brings in HDAX. It represses genes that are required for cell cycle progression. And so, if, uh, uh, if, if, if CDK keeps on firing, you push the, the cell through the cell cycle and it fully gets on divide. P16 is the break on that. It blocks CDKs. P53 is a cell cycle inhibitor. It's normally degraded by ADN2. Right? It's a ubiquitolase, or P3 ligase, if you wish. And P3 is not there. When the cell needs to put the brakes on, DNA damage, other types of stress, it produces P14R that prevents P53 from interacting with MDM2, drives it into the nucleus, and there P53 blocks the cell cycle progression as a transcription type. P21, it makes P21, and that blocks the ADC. So, if you don't have this inhibitor, and if you don't have that inhibitor, the stage is set for cancer. That's basically what BMI does. When I was in, Los when I was in Amsterdam at the Cancer Institute, I actually um, um, was convinced that we were onto something exciting. We had found a novel interactor of BMI called Ring Finger 2, or Ring 1B. And uh, I was gonna show that if Ring 1B um, was knocked out, and we cross them in with B mitrogenics, that these mice were not going to get leukemia. Well, it was even more spectacular than that. that. I didn't even get mice. <laughs> right? So the knockout for ring <coughs> 1B or RM2 gets stuck very early in development. This is what a mouse looks like at seven days in utero. This is a pinhead, a needle. Okay? So it's a very small mouse. And these old socks here, they, they sort of look like old socks. That, that's a knockout for ring 1B. Severe proliferative human diet, and if you cut these out on open, there's nothing normal about it. And so uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because we wanted to know whether that same locus, ink for A, was involved in development as well. First of all, then, we, we tried to, uh, to see whether expression of the ink for A locus was regulated, was increased, if you delete the repressor, right, you expect more expression. Now, this experiment shows that that is the case. This is a wild mouse at that age, and this is a knockout animal at that age. And what we've done here is basically isolated RNA and diluted it in steps of five. Undiluted, five times, 25 times, 125 times, this thing. Okay? And you see here, that the dilution is pretty much petered out already uh, for the first step in the wild type, and that the knockout makes a lot more in for a embryo. <coughs> so that could explain why the embryo doesn't grow as happily as the wild type does. 
And so the trick to, to, to do that is to cross in the ring 1B knockout to a P16 <coughs> knockout, uh, take away the inheritor and hope it continues to grow, and it actually does. So this is a double knockout. This is what a normal animal would look, look like. ink 4 a has no uh, effect on development whatsoever. Animals will get more cancer when they're, when they're born, but no effect on development. And so this is a normal mouse at about 10 days in development. And now we actually find ring 1B knockout animals combination with the infrared that knockout. They're a lot bigger. You can see here, this is the beginning of the neural tube, the neural folds. They will close and then zip up, right? So this is the brain area. This is where the heart is being formed. This little bulge here. So this is the front brain and the midbrain and then the high brain section and here's the tail section. And you can see here that despite um, restores proliferation or growth in this animal, you see that a lot of things are, are completely abnormal. The, the brains are sort of here, the heart is in the wrong place, it's right on top of the, the head. I don't think that's very practical actually. And um, if, we, if we dissect these animals and, and stain them, you can see the precursor of sunlight in this case, and that's it's a mess. So, yes, pre hox development, <coughs> We, uh, we have a proliferative component, which is very important, but there's still a lot of things going on. And then so, as the last slide, uh, introducing our uh, research line, in the meanwhile, people have figured out that both triphylax proteins and polycovalent proteins play an extremely important role in ESX as well as real stem cells. How do you know that? Well, we figured out that what Polycom does in the essence is it actually sits on and keeps off key developmental control genes which are uh, responsible for cell commitment, lineage commitment, and differentiation. So the brain genes, the liver genes, the, the kidney genes, right? It keeps them off. And in that sense, and this is a very simplistic way of thinking, but in that sense, it is responsible for for stem cell self-renewal. It keeps stem cells stem cells. Okay? Uh, and, and more importantly, when these stem cells receive a differentiation clue or stimulus, neurogenic or myogenic or chondrogenic, <coughs> what you see is that these polycom group uh, complexes are going to move around over the chromatin. Many of these um, genes that are kept off, some of them will be actually turned on when cells are, are induced to undergo neurogenesis. So the neurogenes will lose their H3K27 triangle mark and their protein <coughs> association. Whereas other genes, which are not necessary to become a brain cell, are kept off. And vice versa. Okay, so there's active dynamic remodeling of the location of where these complexes hang out, okay, and the epigenetic marks, the underlying epigenetic marks. And so the big questions in biology at the moment are, how does this happen? Who determines what's going to go left and what's going to go right in the development? And how does all, how's all of that organized <coughs> chromatin? Okay? So one of the things that, um, ah, so that was an important question. Good. One of the things that I have become interested in, uh, so this was at the time that I was working at the, uh, the Dutch Cancer Institute in Amsterdam, was, okay, can we, can we, actually, can we actually tell uh, whether there are dynamic changes happening um, to these uh, polygon group complexes if I just look at cells. <coughs> what we've done here is actually I've stained cells blue with a, with a substance called DAPI. DAPI is just in the gallery, it's simply the double strand of the DNA, and it, when you shine on it with a little light, it shines blue back. So you can see the movements. You can see one of these here. You can see chromosomes being pulled apart here, and you see two of them. Now, by virtue of 
staining for a factor which is involved in DNA replication and which associates with chromatin in a cell cycle dependent manner. So it's barely associated. It looks green, but it's basically background. It's hardly associated with chromatin in G1, but it becomes progressively associated with chromatin at origins where DNA replication is firing, is starting. Then it moves to the periphery, right? Uh, to to uh, replicate heterochromatin, that's the last stuff which is rep uh, replicated, and then it peters off into the nucleoli. That is the very last DNA replicated in the cell. So by searching in a in a pool of cells for pCNA staining patterns, I can basically align these cells in terms of their stage in the cell cycle, and I can co-stain them for BMI1. And what you can see here, shut down the lights a little bit, you can see that somewhere in late S, off. All right. You can see that somewhere in late S, uh, all of a sudden, those little uh, <coughs> focal uh, staining points where we find a lot of BMI1, they all of a sudden disappear. They stay away only to reappear when cells establish <coughs> their G1 status again, the next cell cycle round. All right, so that was cool. We lose polygon group proteins from chromatin. Oh, you pretty one. We lose polygon group proteins from chromatin. All that suggested to us that there is dynamics in the system, right? This is taking big leaps. We have repressors on the chromatin, and if we follow them through the cell cycle, we see that they dissociate from chromatin. And then my simplistic way of thinking at that time was, well, if repressors let go of chromatin, they might actually allow a cell to reactivate those genes underneath the repressors, right? And that could be important for differentiation or any type of response. But first, we figure out what was going on. I made differential extracts, and Peggy will tell you all about this in a moment. I isolated G1 cells, and I isolated G2 cells. So I made axolysis of these cells, and I basically ran a Western block. I guess most of you may be familiar with protein analysis. Uh, you, uh, you basically. Um, you basically uh, lyse the cells, you have a mixture of proteins, you run them out based on the size, you separate them on a gel, on an acrylamide gel, then you blot them against the filter and you come back with an antibody that's tagged with something that you can detect, fluorescent or an enzyme. And then the idea is that um, if you see differences in, in, in density levels, uh, th there must be a difference in, in whatever you compare. And what we saw here, is that at G1, BMI runs faster, it's smaller than an M phase. So that was fun. <coughs> BMI gets bigger. How the hell does a protein get bigger? Does anyone know that? How does a protein get bigger? <coughs> uh, post translational modification. Post translational modifications. 10 points for the general one of the real answers. Okay. Post translational modifications, and one of the obvious ones to look at, or the easiest ones to look at, is usually phosphorylation. Now, any protein in the cell, <coughs> I guess most proteins in the cell at one point in time don't respond. There's a kinase responsible for that. It hooks up with ATP, and one of the phosphate groups is transferred from ATP to its target, its substrate, which becomes phosphorylated. Phosphate groups make the protein layer. And so it runs slow. Okay. So if we look again at, at BMI here, we see that um, it actually, this is about a good three, four kilobases, a kilodalton bigger. That's a bunch of phosphosites. To prove that it's phosphorylation, what would you do? To prove that a protein is phosphorylated. What would you do? Think of an experiment. Simple one. To prove
prove that a group is on a protein and causes a, a how do you say that, a, a, an increase in size. What would you do to prove that a group is there? You can remove it. Remove it? Yes, easy peasy. But how do you do that? Phosphatase. Phosphatase. It says that there, right? Here. That says phosphatase. So that's exactly what, what I did in Amsterdam. I took these extracts in M phase when BMI is phosphorylated, and I mixed in calfrontestinal phosphatase. Or I mixed in more calfrontestinal phosphatase. And you can see that you pretty much restore migration speed. Okay? So that's a phosphate group. No doubt about it. All right? We also inhibited the calf intestinal phosphatase. And you can see that I can no longer uh, make this happen. So it's really the phosphatase activity which is responsible for this change. Okay? And then I went on to show that there is a correlation between what is I see here, that in M phase I don't see BMI associated with chromatin anymore. And in G1 phase, I do. And here it's non phosphorylated, and here it is phosphorylated. So, how would you do that? Any idea? Sorry, what was the how would you, how would you, um, how would you prove a correlation between, between uh, chromatin association and phosphorylation? Or inverse, a correlation between uh, protein phosphorylation and chromatin binding. How would you do that? Anyone? How would I prove that a protein is binding to chromatin when it's non-phosphorylated and lets go of chromatin when it is phosphorylated? How would you prove that? <coughs> Think of a cool experiment. With a pull-down assay. Pull-down assay. That's an option, for sure. I didn't do that though. I just made a differential extraction. <coughs> I separated the soluble protein from the chromatin bound protein. Okay? And I did that in both G1 cells and in M cells. But what you can see here is that most of the polycom group proteins, this one and this one, are found in the chromatin bound fraction when I can see them and when they're not phosphorylated. And when I move into M phase, they all of a sudden become soluble. They're phosphorylated. Huh? They, I don't see them anymore. They become soluble. So that's the proof. Simple. Simple experience, OK? Simple questions, simple experience. OK, so this is what we knew. When uh, I was contacted in Amsterdam by a professor in Würzburg, Germany, and he said, look what I found. I've been interested in the kinase called MAPCAP kinase 3 or 3BK or MK3. Those are all acronyms of the same kinase. And uh, what I found is that uh, I was fishing for an interactor because I wanted to know what this kinase does functionally. So I naturally I look for interactors and maybe those interactors will tell me how it works. I've, I pulled out one of the polycom pr proteins. Would you be interested in collaboration? Of course, I had, I was jumping for joy. I was thinking already, well, you know, this phosphorylation associated chromatin release, that's all interesting. That's probably very important for cell cycle progression because, you know, at one point in time, you need to prevent the body chromosomes, and you can only do that when you lose all the protein associated with it. So, big deal. But now this person comes in, this professor comes in with a signaling molecule. And now I get excited, of course, right? I got really excited. And I, I shouted yes. I think I, I wouldn't even have needed a telephone to better know. But anyway. Um, so we went on. We, we, we studied this a little bit. And this is what this paper is all about. Um, and so, um, this is where the paper actually starts. You guys have read it. Huh? Here we present the novel finding that the polycom group protein BMI is phosphorylated by 3 pk and that can 3. A little is 
known about the regulation of polygon function. You can, you can taste already what I was getting at, right? I wanted to know more about this dynamics. Thus, 3PK is candidate regulator of phosphorylation, phosphorylation dependent um, chromatin, BC chromatin. <coughs> and so, this is the abstract of a journal, of a paper. You can learn a lot from the abstract. If an abstract is written good, or how do you say that, efficiently, you can deduce research questions, you can deduce hypotheses, you can deduce anything from it. And so that's what we're going to discuss now. What is the research question here? Did we have one? Well, how did the research start out? Just simple science. Simple science. How did the research start out? <laughs> Somebody found the kinase. <coughs> Somebody had a kinase and found the formative group protein that was wrapping with it. All right? So some of it can be just bloody coincidence, serendipity we call it, right? And so this is this is the analysis of the yeast two hybrids assays, <coughs> the outcome thereof. Uh, yeast two hybrid assays are basically fishing expeditions. So this is how they found the kinase. And basically, I see that I have an order in it. So this is how it works. Normally, um, you can activate an order gene by using a transcription factor which is consisting of two uh, important domains, a DNA binding domain and an activatory domain. Right? And when this transcription factor binds this uh, promoter, it actually activates expression of a reporter gene. Now this is the basis for a yeast to hybrid assay. Who has heard of a yeast to hybrid assay? These days we do a lot more with proteomics, but this is the, the old fashioned way. And it's, it's been extremely powerful. People have found fantastic interactions. So what you do now is you split this transcription factor in two parts. You hook up the binding part to your protein, your favorite protein, basically. Uh, you make a fusion protein, fusion gene, fusion protein. And what you do is you um, fuse the other part which you need, absolutely need, to get activation of this promoter of this gene. You fuse that to a cDNA library in print. So a cDNA library contains thousands, thousands of genes. You've manipulated that, you've stuck uh, part of the DNA sequence to it, to the whole cDNA library, that encodes the back part of this transcription factor. And here's the trick. <coughs> you express this construct, your favorite protein, in yeast cells, in all yeast cells, yeah? But then only when uh, each, sorry, each yeast cell takes up a specific vector and a specific fusion gene from that library, and only when your protein of interest and what we call a prey protein bind, you bring together the binding domain and the activatory domain, and you get expression of the reporter and your yeast cells will turn blue. So the blue color will tell you, hey, there was an interaction. And then you can fish out the particular DNA and determine what it was. And this is how we found these polygon blue proteins. So I go back. Um, many of the fragments that <coughs> we found, 20 fragments turned out to be 20 blue yeast strains turned out to contain HPH2 or PHC2 polygon protein in different sizes, but all of them contained this um, interaction domain, HD2 it's called, and HD2 con consists of five regions, and it turned out through mutation analysis that if we mutate the last lysine, the last alpha helix in this series of five, if we mutated this lysine, we lost interaction. We lost the blue color. And it tells you that um, it is this 
it is this little helix here which is responsible for interaction between MT3 and MTS. And so we went on with co-IPs to show that if we overexpress one protein, uh, HABMI, a tag to BMI, and a tag, a, a, a tag fused to 3PK, if we overexpress them together and pull on one, this is a pull down assay. The gentleman had just uh, uh, referred to that. If we pull on, on, uh, on uh, GSD, we bring down BMI here. And if we pull on HA, we bring down 3PK. So this is, where is BMI? I don't see BMI. Oh no, this is just the expression control. So if we pull on, if we pull on the HA, we bring down 3PK. <coughs> now, this is all very artificial. This is all very artificial. I overexpress proteins. I purify them from bacteria. And I show that they can interact. Found that in yeast, found that in a tube now. Now what would you do? What would you do if you were to prove that this works in real life too? Tell me. <coughs> I've been mixing in proteins in the two, and I find interaction. I've been expressing uh, mammalian proteins in yeast, I find interaction. That's all very exciting, but it doesn't tell me much, does it? I need to prove what? Anyone? In? In a whole cell, basically. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we did, right? <coughs> we showed you things. We overexpressed 3 pk and here we do an immune precipitation again, which is an assay to show protein protein interaction. Peggy will tell you more about it. And if we do the IP with ring, an antibody against brain, you see that we bring down 3PK. If we pull down 3PK, you see that we bring down BMI. <coughs> so we, we've been able to reproduce it with overexpressed proteins. Now what, what else could you, this is still overexpression, right? And any reviewer could say, well, you know, it's overexpression. So there's a lot of protein. <laughs> so it's logical that you force interaction. What would you do? To satisfy a review. Yes, with endogenous proteins. Sure, with endogenous proteins. And this is a little unclear here, but anyways, same thing. <coughs> this is BMI tag. You can barely make that out, right? And here we know that H381 and RAIN should interact with BMI. So if we do an immune precipitation against this protein or that protein, we expect to bring down BMI, and we do. The Western is against BMI, okay? BMI itself, of course, should bring down BMI, that's a positive control. Their negative control shouldn't bring down anything at all, and it didn't. And the important experiment here is that endogenous 3PK antibodies bring down 3PK, but BMI together with it, all right? And we showed it in different cells as well. Uh, or the other way around, if we pull down um, what is it? Uh, in a different cell type, if you pull down HH1, uh, we bring down uh, uh, BMI. If we pull down 3PK, we bring down HPH and BMI. If we pull down ring, we also bring down uh, all the components. Um, uh, that all makes sense. All right. Now then, I've shown an interaction. What would you be interested in next? <laughs> Think about my enthusiastic response to your talk. I'm interested in dynamics. I want to know what this phosphorylation of BMI means. And now we have a kinase that interacts with particle with proteins. Have I proven anything other than that they interact? That's part of it. But what, so, so what do I need to prove? Anyone? Very good. 
Very good. Yes. So it's for the common target. For the <laughs> okay. That's basically what you want to know, right? So establish my camera here. Well, first of all, we started pushing some buttons. Three decades of kinase that sits downstream of Earth and beat very young. It's these classical math and sap kinase, right? The mitogen activated and stress activated kinase. So if we push these buttons, mitogenic or stress, we see that BMI becomes phosphorylated. We had shown that already before, uh, and uh, especially with arsenide, which is P38 uh, stimulator, we get a massive phosphorylation of BMI. Aha! So these pathways target polygonal proteins. Cool. Step one. We quickly show here, in a similar experiment, that we're dealing with phosphorylation, the IP BMI, and its co-interactor, co co HPH1. And we mix in the phosphatase, and we see that in the migration uh, speed is stored again. So, yep, it's phosphorylation. And then we show here that um, there are several proteins that actually become phosphorylated you know, downstream of P38 signal. Uh, it's HBH1, HBC2, BMR itself. <coughs> Doesn't seem to happen much to ring 1B or RF2. So, apart from the fact that we see that there is some phosphorylation, apparently other proteins are not phosphorylated. Ha! Might be differential regulation. Now we showed it um, in different cells that it works the same way, human fibroblast. This was all done in human osteosarcoma <coughs> cells. We show it here in human fibroblast. Two little bands if I stimulate the whole lot in, uh, in uh, kidney cells and in uh, cervical carcinoma cells. All of them eventually lead to phosphorylation of BMI. We use a bunch of inhibitors and we block it. We use an inhibitor of P38. And indeed, if you don't use the inhibitor, you see that the stimulation leads to phosphorylation. If you use the inhibitor, you see that you block that pretty much. So that's another nice way of showing that the pathway that you're claiming is important actually plays a role. Inhibited, we did it with P38, we did it with, we, we did it with Earth. You see phosphorylation, and together with the, um, the stimulus and the inhibitor, you see that the phosphorylation is reduced. Okay? So that's cool. Yes, we can block it. And then what? And then what? We show that um, we have a, a pathway that targets polygon group proteins for phosphorylation. We show we have a kinase. And um, our working idea was, does it lead to derepression of genes? Now, these polygon group repressors are sitting on chromatin. And the working idea is phosphorylation would tease them off. Right? So what do I need to prove? What do I need to prove? The proteins remains bind, uh, keep the binding uh, with the chromatin. Yeah. So the, what what the lady here says? What's your name? Uh, Sara. Sara. Yes. Okay. Sara. Good answer. Um, uh, Sara says, you know, uh, if it's if it's any of any use for cells to uh, to to talk to chromatin in this way and tease off polygon group complexes from the chromatin. Know, relieve repression, you should see the complex disappear. <coughs> Remember, we saw this in a cell cycle dependent manner. What we've done here is we've arrested these cells in G1 so as not to be bothered by S and G2M uh, related dissociation. So, whatever happens here is for real. It's not cell cycle dependent, it's signaling dependent. We've arrested these cells in G1 by simply taking away serum. Okay? And cells don't divide. And so what we see, if we then stimulate the cells in G1 with serum, <coughs> mitogenic factors, we see that you lose association. Right? If you stimulate them with a stressor, arsenide, you see that you lose association. So this is signaling associated dissociation. Cool stuff. If we block P38, we block dissociation. It all seems very relevant. We look quickly at the complexes as a whole, a CBX, RNF2, RNF1A, RNF2, 
and uh, BHC or HPC1, all the interactions of BMI. And you can see that where they perfectly match up in G1, here also, at least uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, huh? So they perfectly overlap, so they form one big happy complex. When you stimulate the cells with arsenide, you lose them all. Hey, except for HP1. HPH1. Hmm. So we have differential responses. We have proteins that have no chromatin, and we have proteins that appear to spread over chromatin. Cool, another, how do you say that? Unpredicted find. All right, and here we prove that that is the case. And phase, I remember, most of HPH and BMI is soluble, but if you stimulate the cells with arsenide, only BMI becomes soluble, but HPH1 remains associated. These are only soluble fractions. Okay, so what we proved here is there an effect of phosphorylation or the protein and chromatin association. And there it is. And that's what it looks like in color. All right. So, we have polycombin proteins, a kinase that interacts. We show that upstream signaling pathways target polycombin proteins for phosphorylation, and we show that phosphorylation is, correlates with um, chromatin dissociation. What haven't we proven yet? Story started out with 3PK. What haven't we proven yet? Demon. I've shown an involvement of FERC. I've shown an involvement of P38. I haven't shown an involvement of 3PK. Exactly. If I make a claim that 3PK is important, I don't show it, right? So this is, this is a bunch of experiments that actually show that. These are in vitro kinase assays. You take the kinase, you purify it for bacteria, an active kinase. You take your substrate, BMI in this case, you mix in hot ATP, hot ATP meaning radioactive, right? The last phosphate is radioactive, and so your substrate will become radioactive if the kinase reaction works. And that's what you see here. BMI becomes phosphorylated, it's hot. In, in, uh, in, in, uh, in a case where we've actually purified BMI and 3 pk from cells, and this is where we purify it from, um, from bacteria. It's barely visible. Controlled, no kinase, or kinase dead. And here is the kinase mixed in with BMI, it becomes hot. So that's a very direct measurement. How should I do this in cells? How would I do this in cells? I don't want to work with radioactivity in cells. Way too messy on the risk of contaminating the whole lab, including myself, and I don't want that. So how, how would you do that? To prove that 3DK is the kinase for polycombin proteins. How would you do that? Not no kind of 3DK. What? No kind of 3DK. And that's what we did. Exactly here. We took a, we designed three knockout vectors, and we were very fortunate, because two of them worked, this one and that one. You can see that the 3DK protein was produced. This one didn't work that well. But it worked in our advantage anyways. Because you can see that if you now look at BMI and in cells that are stimulated with, with uh, serum, glycogen factors, you can see that wherever 3DK is missing, there's progressively less phosphorylation of BMI. And when it's, when it's there, 3DK, you see that BMI migrates higher. All right? And here you see the same thing. Let's look at it in color. Normally, we expect BMI to dissociate. So um, this is control. Hold on. This is control. This is uh, RNAi vector against 3DI, 3DK. This is uh, not stimulated. This is stimulated. <coughs> Whereas normally, you lose your protocol. In this case, you spread it out. Now, you don't lose it you lack the kinase, all right? So that shows you very nicely that we're getting the story together here. Find the kinase that interacts with BMI. 
to identify pathways that can lead to transformation of DNA <coughs> and other forms of proteins. We show, just like in the cell cycle, that in a signaling dependent manner, we lose polycomplete proteins from chromatin if we activate particular phosphorylation cascades. We show that free decay at least in vitro is capable of targeting BNI. And if we mess with it, that phosphorylation is also messed up. Okay, so what would be the last thing to know that you wanted to know? Probably the biology behind it, right? What does it mean? Huh? So, first of all, we looked at, so in other words, does activation of or overexpression of 3 decay in this case, does that lead to all the gene expression? All right, so what we did here is first we looked at whether 3 decay hangs out where VMI hangs out, <coughs> which is at the total level. So we did differential extraction again, totalizate, soluble fraction, and the bound fraction. And we happen to know that a kinase dead mutant of 3 decay versus the control of alpha, or a, a constitutively active kinase, or do not reside in the nucleus that long. Some of them don't even make it. So we see that in the chromatin bound fraction, the wild type kinase just sits there. It is there. So it can actually do its work if it were asked to do so. And indeed, it sells an overexpressed 3 pk You see that less BMI is chromatin bound. And remember that I told you about BMI in cancer? Ink for a locus, B16, B14. We see that it sells where 3 pk is overexpressed. A BMI is lost from the chromatin. In these cells, we see that E14 is expressed again. See that? In color. Usually, white cells don't express a lot of E14 unless, apparently, you tease them with 3DK. So that was nice. We have a couple of things now to show the effect uh, gene expression. They're associated, the kinase and the polygon complexes. These cascades target BMI, and the, B, the polycom chromatin interaction is phosphorylase independent. We show that 3PK phosphorylase BMI directly at least in vitro, and that 3PK increased, 3PK expression releases BMI and chromatin <coughs> and de represses the infrared. So, I mean, this was enough to write up and to publish in the JGC. Uh, and and, and, and I did most of the work together. And the professor in Würzburg got the honors of being co authored because he, of course, found HPH2. So, thanks, Al. What, what time is it? What time is it? 12 o'clock. I think I'm going to stop here and ask Peggy to take over. Uh, so, basically, our current working hypothesis for, at that time when we had figured out that stuff was, well, maybe this whole pathway there is meant <laughs> to target these polycomplete chrome complexes and to get them off of chromatin in, in essence, providing an epigenetic or epigenomic switching mechanism. Huh? You activate these kinases, you tease them off. That was a simple working hypothesis that we had. Okay. And so, um, Peggy's going to tell you next about um, um, what we did to actually investigate this. Does anyone have any technical questions of technical uh, nature or, or anything else about the part that I just told you about? Now would be the time to ask, not afterwards, because Peggy and I both have to run. You guys have a tendency to flock down when the lecture is over. Not today. No questions? I have a question. You have a question. <coughs> yes. Very good. Um, uh, just before starting to talk about this paper and this uh, experiment, uh, we were talking about the, the previous experiment that you did in Amsterdam. Yeah, the cell cycle dependent phosphorylation. Yeah, yes. And there was a um, um, figure about, uh, I think, a Western block uh, um, in which uh, there were the previous, previous slides. Oh, Here we this are. one. That, this one. Uh, yes, with the yes, the experiment with the phosphatase. What 
are the oh, higher, one. yes. What are <coughs> the, what's the meaning of the higher uh, this? seats? Yes. Huh. Good question. Can anyone explain this? What is uh -huh. the what is the what is the meaning of this battle? Housekeeping G, maybe. Housekeeping G. But Why? But you are detecting only BMI one. Yeah. So there are there is <coughs> BMI one that sleeps this time. Well, this is this is a Western blot where all possible proteins that I've extracted from these cells are on. This is a, 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 a how do you say that a, a piece of nitrocellulose, piece of filter, right? All but proteins are on there, but I'm using an antibody which supposedly detects Sorry, BMI only. Ah. And you know how that works with antibodies. Have you ever worked with antibodies? Yes, yes, I have. Okay, and your blots were always squeaky clean, or not? No, no, it's not. Well, no, how no. <laughs> so what was your problem then? No, I maybe maybe uh, an specific uh, specific uh, response. This is exactly what it is. <coughs> I thought you were going to ask me about that little holder. <laughs> no, it's uh, uh, What is it? Um, uh, air bubble. Air, air bubble. Air, yeah, yeah, air Very bubble. good. Yeah, air bubble. Uh, high quality <laughs> air bubble. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> no. Then we're moving on to Peggy's <laughs> presentation. <laughs> Oh, no. the the, the, the rescue. Are these are little things that will appear during the journal club uh, on Friday as well. Uh, silly things, yeah. like uh, the uh, yeah. uh, one of the bad do there. Yeah. 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 Huh? Yeah. I mean, um, we're going to rip the whole paper apart. <coughs> <coughs> Ja, dat is de promo. 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 But I will also talk you through the figures, and each figure I also want to explain a little bit more about the techniques we use. <coughs> if you did more of okay, how it exactly worked in the lab. So just to refresh your memory, I just think there are a few slides we have already showed you in this presentation. So we went up, we look at the polygon group proteins, and these actually provide cells with a transcription memory. And they are kind of uh, different states of which the two most important ones are depicted here. So we have the right complex, which is involved in the triangulation of rising uh, 27 on the H3 field. And there is the Pearson 1 complex, which can actually recognize this mark, bind it, and then keep it from them in closed configuration and thereby inducing gene repression. So we've also already showed that. There are a lot of uh, epigenetic uh, complexes which can interact with polygon group proteins and which can actually regulate eventually polygon function. And that's what we are interested in, really in the dynamics, how changes in the cell environment can actually talk to chromatin, possibly via these polygon group proteins. And in this talk, also, I will focus on uh, the kinases. So the um, <coughs> protein complex which can phosphorylate polygon group proteins. We have already introduced the kinase which we work on, which is MK3. So this will come also back in this presentation. And these, uh, actually, these, uh, all these complexes can postpose a lot of different uh, modifications, but it will be much too hard to go into all of these in this presentation. So we, again, we focus on the phosphorylation. And just to remind you that um, we've seen that indeed that uh, on cell cycle progression, Proteins were lost from the chromatin and it is correlated with phosphorylation. But here we detected an increase in <coughs> band, so with a high band on the western one. And also, what we have shown, which was in the JVC paper, it is red, is that upon acute stimulation of cells, 
either with serum TPA, so with nitrogenic stimulation, or with stress. We also <coughs> see that there is vanishing superior communicating from phosphorylation. And again, we see that, can be, that the chromatin bound speckles, which you see on the left side, disappear when you should add serum to these cells. So we see an interaction between follicle association and phosphorylation. So now, my first question to you is, what other way could we use to detect uh, phosphorylation other than by looking at its shift in band size? Labeling. Yeah, that's right. So it's fluorescent label. In this case, it's immunocytic chemistry because you label like inside of the cell. And it's indeed uh, used with fluorescence. So, again, to show you with how it works, is so first of all, you grow your cells in a plate. However, because you now would like to look at the protein expression inside your cell, you don't want to make lysis because then you end up having a mixture of all uh, your membranes will be lysed, will end up with one soup of proteins, and you don't know where the proteins are expressed. So if you would actually fix your cells inside the plate, then you could also do the stain within the plate, so you add your antibody against the protein of interest, and subsequently you add the secondary antibody, which is fluorescently labeled. And this will allow you to, on the microscopy, to actually do a different kind of stain. So there, there is something <coughs> here on the lower side of the side, but uh, I want to indicate a few differences. So on the left hand side, you see an example <coughs> of a stain where there is a cytoplasmic expression of your protein. So you see that the nucleus, which you see mostly in 
black is not stained. However, the side of that we see that looks nice and fluorescent and green. And in the middle picture, I put a slide where you see actually there is a nuclear expression of the protein. So you see especially the nucleus in green, whereas the cytoplasm is largely unstained. And the interesting thing of this is also this method is also that you can actually combine different antibodies in one uh, experiment. So you can, for example, if you have a membrane-associated protein, which is labeled in red, you can see here, <coughs> there is a DAP staining in blue, which uh, colors your DNA, and there is a cytoplasmic protein, which is seen in green. So we have like a lot of different proteins which you can measure in one cell. And one question to you again is, what is actually the limiting uh, step in the number of colors or the number of proteins you can detect in one cell at the same time. I'll give you a short hint to that. You must have to think about secondary antibodies you have. So of course, there is the number of colors, but I don't think that's there's a lot of different ones which you can use. Where do secondary where do secondary antibodies come from? Does anyone know that? Thank you. 
actually what we also uh, use as a basis about the, the phosphorylation uh, link with aircraft initiation and also HCM, HCM28 phosphorylation. So as we have already explained, the, uh, the ideas, what we think are hypothesis, is that the uh, link between MP3 and polycom actually imposes an epigenetic switch mechanism which enables the cell to respond to changes in the microbiome. So in this case, we studied mitogenic signaling. So if we add serum uh, to the cells, what would happen with the pyrosome by association? Does this let go from within? And do we see then uh, target genes which respond, which are induced upon this association? So for this, uh, we use a model, and the most of the model will be on the sheet yet. Uh, so we use phytogenic stimulation. And as William already mentioned, that the upstream kinases of MP3 are both ERK and p 3 g so the map kinase signaling and the kinase signaling pathway. And I hear, I group said, just a uh, simplification <coughs> of that. So we add uh, growth factors to the cells. They will activate this uh, pathway. They will eventually also activate MP3. And MP3 is part of the interacts with polycom, and therefore it is uh, phosphorylated polycom and then uh, with the associated polycom. So to investigate this, we would like to have a readout of the system. And because we knew that there is a gene called ETS3, which is an immediate early gene, that this responds to um, uh, microbial <coughs> stimulation, and in addition to that, it's also a part of the gene. So this was uh, used as a readout to study this system. We are just uh, put in a little picture to show you the expression on MP3. <coughs> so uh, what we do first is we serum star the cells. So we actually, just if you have to go to draw some blood from them so you are not allowed to eat, do the thing with the cells. Only we do it for 48 hours. And so we keep a low serum on them and then subsequently we add 15% uh, of the serum uh, together with the football astro, which is also involved in reduction simulation. And we see that for one hour there's a 40 fold induction of AD3, and upon six hours it's already back to zero. So then, my first question is how, oh, already <laughs> how do we measure the um, mRNA expression? With which method we use to get? Yeah, I see somebody nodding. QPCR. QPCR, that's right. So what we do again, so first we grow the cells, and subsequently again we make uh, a lysate, only now we use different <coughs> uh, buffers, we use, uh, for example, trisol, and then we make, uh, we do an RNA isolation, and subsequently what we have to do first is to make, <coughs> we make out of this RNA, so we do the reverse <coughs> transfer phase step, so to uh, synthesize DNA, cDNA, and subsequently what we do is we do a PCR reaction. Uh, so here in red, I depicted the primers. So we have a open and a reverse primer. And in this reaction, we also include a DNA binding chemical, which is called type of green. So maybe some of you have already heard about it. And this actually specifically binds to any kind of DNA. So and once it's bound to the DNA, it starts to fluoresce. So in, in solution, so the blue dot here, Cyber in solution, so it's not or really, really low uh, fluorescent, but once it binds to DNA, then you see that, it's in the, that uh, the fluorescence increases up to a thousand fold. So, what happens during your PCR reaction? You amplify your cDNA, so you have a lot of different uh, cDNAs, and they will all bind to the cyber and they all fluoresce. So, in time, you'll end up having more and more signal. And this is actually also. Um, Quantitative, so what you can do, and eventually you end up with a, a result which looks like this. So, this is a few PCR analysis, so I will not go into too much detail. But here, there is a, I showed you an evolution series. So, we have your NTC, where this actually gives you control. So, there you only add your mixture, but no DNA, no cDNA. So, this is just to correct for the background signal. And uh, the more uh, DNA, cDNA you add, the earlier you detect it. So that was the principle, of course, of your uh, reaction. So here, in this case, so the red is the more uh, cDNA included, so, and then the threshold is indicated with this orange line. So there you will reach a threshold much earlier. 
area, and if you do the third layout, uh, you're seeing. So then, to come back to the model, so we use 83 as a readout. How would I, if I would want to study the upstream taking kinds, which one would be involved in taking to MP3 in the case of nitrogen safety? How would I can study this? Which method I could use? We want to look at the function or at the upstream kinds.
This section is awfully quiet here. Thank God. Please, what, 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 is, what is the next question? You use two inhibitors and nothing happens anymore. I can use one. Simple question. One and the other one recently. Mm -hmm. No? Separate, yeah. To separate? Yeah. Right. So, what we did next <coughs> is we used both inhibitors separately. So, first of all, if we. So, here yeah. again, we have star cells and it's stimulated. So, in the control, again, we see that there is phosphorylation of star cell DA, there is particle dissociation, and if we see that uh, uh, inhibit MAC, we still see H3 serum plaqueate phosphorylation. So, this is not inhibited by MAC. However, we still retain PRC1. So apparently, <coughs> it does not prevent serum 28 phosphate. However, PRC1 is still bound to the prime. So if something else happens to PRC1 or does not happen to PRC1 <coughs> to prevent it from dissociating. And if we do P38 nephra, hey, then we don't see H serum 28 phosphate. So apparently, the P38 is responsible from serum 28 phosphorylation. And also in this case, we see that uh, polycom does not dissociate. So apparently there is two